Have you ever wondered why some people have red hair? Well, wonder no more. But before you start wondering too hard, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is that all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. It turns out, assuming you believe the story published by Septi Caput Capitus Council and the fire of Rankin demon horde who secretly rule- What are we talking about? Who secretly rule the world in Edinburgh, Scotland, it's not because redheads are the spawn of Satan and otherwise evil at heart. Rather, it's because of a little thing called the Melacortin 1 receptor, or MC1R for short. All right then, I get the feeling I'm missing a joke here. Anyway, everyone has Melancortin 1 receptors, even me. But in redheads, this is mutated via being twisted by evil rites, which we shall not speak of here. This mutation in the MC1R also causes them to have a light skin from having less eumelanus. Oh god. These sciencey ones. Say, so, oh no. Uh, what's the man in my eumelanin? Eumelanin, eumelanin, eumelanin. Mm. This mutation in the MC1R also causes them to have light skin from having less eumelanin pigmentation and more pheomelanin pigmentation. This is a genetic advantage for people living in parts of the world where there is little sunlight. Having lighter skin lets more sunlight through, which increases the production of vitamin D, which in turn is useful for preventing things like rickets and for fending off the holy hordes of heaven. As anyone who's been around a redhead knows, though, having skin that won't turn has decided disadvantages when the sun is out. Putting a true redhead, as opposed to all those brownhead women who like to call themselves redheads in the sun for any length of time, tends to have the same effect as putting a fork in the microwave. It's entertaining to watch, but it's not very pleasant for the fork, <laughs> if forks had feelings. This tends to lead to much higher rates of skin cancer and birth defects due to the sun destroying the levels of folic acid in their skin, in addition to the normal number of birth defects you'd expect to see when a spawn of Satan breeds with one of their unholy brethren. And we, we went from forks in microwave to horrible medical conditions like that. Most redheads carry two mutated MC1R genes, one from their demonic father and one from their unholy mother. In the case where someone only carries one copy of the mutated MC1R, they tend to end up having brown hair with light skin, though when female, they will insist on telling everyone they're a redhead because when they apply their hair directly to the sun, it has a minuscule reddish hue before it inevitably bursts into flames. This mutated MC1R gene also happens to be recessive. What this means is that you can carry one of the unholy genes, but be a much more natural blonde or brunette. People who carry only one copy are known as carriers, just like with a disease. This is why a redhead can be born from two parents that aren't redheads themselves. Both parents have a functioning MC1R gene and a mutated evil version. In this case, there is roughly a 25% chance that a child from one of these two will be a spawn of Satan. Other variations can also happen. For instance, if one parent carries two copies of the mutated MC1R and has therefore likely sold their soul to Satan, and another is only half evil with one mutated MC1R and one normal, then there would be about a 50% chance that their child would be a redhead. <laughs> Whoever wrote this clearly <laughs> so really doesn't like redheads. Oh my. Who wrote this script? <laughs> wow, David and Kathy. <laughs> Who upset you? Interestingly, contrary to popular belief, redheads weren't just located in Northern Europe throughout history. In fact, there were pockets of people all over the world that had red hair, from Russia to China to certain groups of Jews and many others. There are even references to indicate there were indigenous peoples of Africa with bright red hair. Today, however, Scotland has the highest proportional population of redheads at about 13%. The most redheads in any nation, though, is the United States, with about 15 million of them. Another reason is that nowadays people are much more mobile than we were before. Because of this, and the fact that redhead is a recessive gene, even though the mutated gene itself is still being passed along, getting the two mutated copies necessary to produce a redheaded child is becoming much less likely. Before this increased mobility, groups that had excessive amounts of people with this gene mutation tended to stay in one spot, so inevitably pockets of redheads would pop up, making it more likely that they'd in turn mate with other redheads, thus perpetuating this particular brand of evil through the general 
generations. <laughs> From this, you may or may not have heard that redheads will extremely shortly be extinct, with this notion particularly being popularized thanks to a 2007 study done by the Oxford Hair Foundation. However, it turns out that this is a pretty big exaggeration, and we're guessing that over-exaggeration wasn't influenced at all by the study being founded by the hair dye maker Procter & Gamble, who was trying to boost the sale of red hair dye. It's pretty sketchy. First, we know redheads won't be extinct anytime soon because there will always be new people in the world with only evil in their heart. Second, because the mutated gene itself is still being passed on, even when a redhead is not produced, while the overall numbers may continue to diminish by diffusification, the potential for a redheaded stepchild will remain for millennia. And even without that, the 150 million or so true redheads in the world, about 1 in 50 people, will ensure we'll not be rid of them en masse for centuries to come. Incidentally, fun fact, in Greek mythology, redheads turn into vampire-like creatures when they die. And speaking of things that are the spawn of Satan, bugs in the code that you will find when you design and build your own website from scratch, well, you don't have to worry about that at all because of Squarespace. And yes, that is how we get from Spawn of Satan to Squarespace. That, folks, is a transition. Now, two simple things. Number one, maybe you've got an idea for a website or a business. It's in your head and you're thinking, Maybe I should start that business. Maybe I should put it out there into the world and see what's up. Well, two, the only way to figure out whether that is something that is worth doing is to give it a try. And I know that can be daunting because it's really scary out there in that demon-filled world. People might not like your new business idea, but the website shouldn't be an excuse to giving it a shot. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. You wanna sell something online? Oh yes, Squarespace can do it. Or a podcast? Well, yes, you can do that on Squarespace too. You wanna start a YouTube channel? No, you can't do that. You start a YouTube channel on YouTube. That's why it's called a YouTube channel, but tell you what, you will want a companion website to go along with it. Now it all starts on Squarespace with a stunning template that you can customize to your heart's content. And I don't have it in my copy here, but they've got cool names like Royce. And I'm like, you know if it's called Royce, it's gonna look good because there's something else called Royce that also looks good. A Rolls Royce. It's the Rolls Royce of website design. I should get back to my talking points. Don't start from scratch. Use a template, no excuses. Then there's the customization process, make it look beautiful, and you don't have to deal with any tech BS. Plus, if you get confused, which you probably won't because it's easy, there's 24-7 customer support. I don't even know why they do customer support. It's so easy, you won't even need it. But if you do, it's there. Squarespace.com forward slash brain food is where you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. There is also a link below. And let's do a bonus fact, shall we? Speaking of vampires, Vlad Dracula, son of the dragon, also known as Vlad Tepes or Vlad the Impaler. If they put the little sign at the bottom of the S, I could probably guess that. Well, why do you remember him today? Well, it's largely thanks to this hero of Christendom's war against the Muslim world. Vlad had pretty good reason to hate the Turks, at least by his own estimation. When his father, Vlad II Dracul, was still in power, he handed over his two young sons to the Ottoman Turks as a sign of good faith. Vlad Dracula lived as their pseudo prisoner for five years and fostered a deep hatred for both the Turks and Islam. On the flip side, his brother thrived in the environment, becoming friends with Sultan Murad's son and even converting to Islam. Come on, Vlad, make the best of a bad situation, just like your brother. <laughs> You're a prisoner, may as well make the most of it. When Vlad came to the throne, his tiny principality was a mess. The crime rate was high, the food supply was low, and trade was virtually non-existent. So it was an awesome time all around. Dude, you should have stayed with the Turks. He knew a country in such a sorry state didn't have a chance of fending off those Ottoman Turks. <laughs> Hopefully not directly his brother. <laughs> so he enacted many new strict laws and enforced incredibly harsh penalties on those who stepped out of line. Vlad got his Impaler moniker in honor of one of these punishments. While he certainly wasn't the first to use this particularly nasty form of torture and death, the sheer number of people he put through this heinous ordeal was extremely noteworthy. When Vlad's victims were impaled, these sharpened wooden stakes would be rammed through their bodies in various ways. One skilled in this Art could even do it in such a way that the pole would slide nicely through much of the body, often from the bottom up. Dude. Oh, and the idea was it wouldn't penetrate any vital organs. What about your ass? That seems like, I, I know it's not vital, but dude. 
In this way, the condemned could sometimes live for several days suspended in midair and left to their agonizing demise. Their remains were sometimes left as a cautionary reminder to Vlad's subjects. People would be pissed if the queen did that. It wasn't just his subjects who felt his wrath. When Sultan Mehmed II sent emissaries inquiring why Vlad hadn't coughed up his non-Muslim tribute yet, the seething Dracula explains that he was all tapped out thanks to a recent war with Hungary. He then questioned why the ambassadors hadn't removed their turbans as a sign of respect when they approached him. They replied it wasn't customary for them to do so. That didn't sit too well with Dracula, who apparently wasn't much of a diplomat. He ordered his guard seize the emissaries and nail their turbans to their heads. The Turks died a horribly painful death. Vlad sent them back to Mehmed II with a little note asking that he never send such uncouth ambassadors to his court again. Yeah, Vlad, they're the uncouth ones. <laughs> Things were about to get real. In 1460, they weren't already, dude. <laughs> In 1462, Vlad and his troops, they crossed the Danube, wreaking havoc wherever they went. He wrote a letter about this on February the 2nd, 1462, to the King of Hungary, Matthias Corvinius, stating, I have killed peasants, men and women, old and young, who lived at Oblusitsa and Novopselo, maybe, uh, where the Danube flows into the sea. We killed 23,884 Turks without counting those who we burned in homes or the Turks whose heads were cut by our soldiers. All right, I guess they, you know, chopping their heads off doesn't count. Thus, your highness, you must know that I have broken the peace. In response, Sultan Mehmed II's troops, led by Hamza Pasha, crossed the Danube River, moving closer to Wallachia. Vlad sent decoys suffering with everything from the bubonic plague, leprosy, and tuberculosis into the enemy's encampments as a form of biological warfare and employed a scorched earth campaign. He had far fewer troops than the Turks, who came with an army of about 90,000 and depended on guerrilla warfare tactics. By June the 16th, 1462, the Turks were outside the Wallachian capital of Targo Vistia. Vlad decided to surprise the tank with the purpose of assassinating Mehmed II was his best bet. Just after the stroke of midnight on June the 17th, 1462, Vlad Dracula and his troops attacked. The Turks desperately rose in defense against the Wallachian onslaught for the next several hours, but the carnage was brutal. An estimated 15,000 Ottomans were killed in a single night. While this was good for Vlad, it only put a small dent in the enemy army and wasn't his main objective. As mentioned, what he was really trying to do was kill Sultan Mehmed. Met the second. In spite of all the careful planning confusion set in during the heat of battle, the Sultan's two commanders, Ishak Pasha and Mahmud Pasha, were killed, but Mehmed escaped unscathed. As dawn approached and the Ottomans began organizing an efficient counterattack, Dracula ordered a retreat without achieving his prime objective. This spelled the end of the famous night attack, which would be heralded as a great day for Christendom and see Vlad named a hero. What a hero. The Turk... <laughs> What a war criminal. The Turkish army approached Targovistia four days after... And people in the comments time it was a different time. Yeah, but he was still a d**k, wasn't he? The Turkish army approached Targovistia four days after the night attack. The gates of the city were wide open and they were greeted by an ominous silence. However, the sight before them was unimaginably grotesque. An endless field of decomposing corpses made up of thousands of Turks and Bulgarian Muslims impaled in every configuration possible. I told you! It had the desired effect, according to the 15th century historian Lanicus something or other. Not in the pronunciation dictionary, so Leonicus Chalcondals, maybe. It reads, the Sultan's army came across a field with stakes about three kilometers long and one kilometer wide, and there were large stakes on which they could see the impaled bodies of men, women, and children, about 20,000 of them, as they said, quite a spectacle for the Turks and the Sultan himself. The Sultan, in wonder, wow, <laughs> kept saying that he could not conquer the country of a man who could do such terrible and unnatural things. Vlad continued the war, but ultimately was betrayed for reasons unknown today by one of his former allies, the aforementioned King Matthias Corvinus. After Corvinus captured Vlad, he was imprisoned, but around 1475 he was released and began once again to wage a war against the Turks. Dude, let it go. <laughs> Some two years later, he was dead. It isn't clear how or exactly when he died, but it is generally thought he was killed in battle, with his head being taken as a trophy by the Turks. Told you you should have dropped it, dude. This has been Today I found out, if you enjoyed this video, smash that thumbs up button below, don't forget to subscribe, and don't go watch another YouTube video right now, I see you procrastinating. 
I see you there. Go, subscribe, join, whatever, Squarespace. Use the link below and make yourself a beautiful website. Go on, just do it, and I'll see you next time.